Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode, uh, episode four, actually, of the Five Town and Around podcast. Tonight's guest is one of my best friends and uh, a musician who I've played with in several bands now, uh, Shane Martell. How are you doing today, Shane? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. I'm glad to have you on the show. Um, <clears throat> this is a, somewhat of a special episode because um, Shane and I have an announcement to make. There is going to be... Uh, a concert on February 29th at the Starlight in Southbridge, and it's actually going to feature two of our bands. Uh, most of you guys are going to be familiar with the first one, Jabuda will be headlining, and Shane and I's new project uh, called Bigelow. Uh, we both play guitar. Um, Mike from Fiddlehead is on bass, and Joe from uh, Humblebee is on drums. So this is a new group we put together. These are all Wormtown guys. We've been playing together for about a year, and we're going to be opening up the show similar style to Djibouti in the jam scene, and Shane brings a lot of, you know, his influences, which are kind of outside the jam spectrum to, to that. So for those of you who are interested, if uh, you want any information, get in touch with me or Shane or any of the other guys. Uh, it's still coming together. We haven't come up with a name for the event yet, but we, we do want it to be something special as it's a leap year. And, uh, I was thinking maybe like the JB Leap Show. Huh, there you go. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Yeah. But, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so getting back to our guest tonight. Again, uh, Shane is a phenomenal guitar player. He's a gear nerd. He has more pedals and a better understanding of how to actually use technology while playing a guitar than anyone that I've met. And I've met quite a few guitar players over the year. I'm a little bit more uh, conservative, refined. I've got about six pedals, and I've had some of them since I was... Uh, late teens. So Shane, uh, let's start with a mutual love of guitar. How long have you been playing guitar? I started playing when I was 11. I got a, uh, I asked my mom for a guitar for Christmas and I got one of those sweet Ibanez Geo starter packs with a little mm -hmm. eight inch speaker, yeah. you know, practice amp. Yeah, so, I had the Fender version. Nice. Uh, same thing. Nice. I think the Ibanez was probably just a little bit higher quality, to be honest. Oh, maybe. I don't know. The the Geos, I mean, really any guitar that you get, if you get a setup right, it doesn't really matter, you know? True. And uh, one thing I've learned over the years is you can take a shit guitar and put really good pickups in it, and it'll sound amazing, even if the action sucks. Absolutely. I think, for me, one of the most important things and what I've learned over the years, especially from watching... Uh, a lot of other musicians play, you know, uh, instruments that you wouldn't think, you know, a multi-million dollar musician would play, is uh, what, what's more important than anything, I think, when it comes to guitar, is making sure it's set up properly, making sure that, you know, you, you got fresh strings on there, you know, bring it, bring it to, you know, a qualified technician who can see if it has high frets, see if the neck needs to be adjusted, anything like that, and you could turn any $200 guitar and make it play as well as, you know, any Gibson or, you know, American Fender that's out there. It might not sound as well because of the electronics. Mm -hmm. I think pickups definitely have a big part of that, but uh, especially if you're just starting out or if you have kids that want to learn how to play guitar, that would be like my advice, mm -hmm. you know, is to, uh, you know, buy something cheap but have it set up right, you know? Interesting. Uh, and to take that a step further, Shane and I both have the same quote-unquote guitar tech, uh, D-string guitar repair. Uh, the owner's name is Dave, correct? Yeah, yeah. He's off of Main Street in Sturbridge. <coughs> I used to go to Gordon Music all the time, and Shane had mentioned that he was going to this gentleman, and um, I knew where his location was, so after Shane's recommendation, I went and met with him. Uh, any guitar players out there, I highly suggest you go and work with Dave at D-String Guitar Repair off of Main Street, Sturbridge. Um, Phenomenal guy, great musician. He's a player as well as uh, a guy who knows the technical ins and outs of a guitar. Um, he set up two guitars I have. Uh, it was relatively new Epiphone Florentine Pro Les Paul Hollow Body and uh, my Ibanez AWD83. Uh, the latter one, which you know I've had for probably at least 15 years. And walking away from that setup, uh, my guitars definitely played better than they ever had before. And quite frankly, I could notice. Uh, more than subtle differences between getting it done at Gordon's or Guitar Center versus this gentleman's work. So shout out to David D. String Guitar Repair and uh, 
you have a guitar and you haven't got it set up in a while, go check it out. Uh, with that being said, moving on, Shane, <coughs> uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, you know, you and I have been playing in a uh, semi-professional jam band scene for a while now. I mean, you know, we've done the Wormtown festivals, we, we toured for a period of time yeah. over the past 10 years, and, you know, we've had some, some good success in just getting our name out there and being able to travel and being able to play music. Uh, but one of the things I loved about you, uh, just playing in any musical group, whether it was Jabuda or Dubious Monk's Synchronicity Project or now Bigelow, is you're, you're not really, or you weren't originally a jam band guy. You come from a very different sort of main influence on your music than myself, who's heavily influenced by Fish, The Grateful Dead, and obviously, you know, I have other influences, but you didn't really come from that at all. Uh, who is your top three uh, favorite bands currently? And oh, that is a loaded question, but I will try to answer it. So my favorite band is right now, and it's a little biased because I just saw them play last Thursday, Tool is one of my favorite, will be all my, one of my all-time favorite bands. Yeah. Um, mostly because they've influenced me in just like looking at music differently, almost from like a mathematical perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, um, their incorporation of like polyrhythms and um, just the way they all meld together and they take what... Each part could be, you know, except for Danny Carey, who's always just, I, he blows my mind. But yeah. as far as, like, Adam Jones and Justin Chancellor on guitar and bass are concerned, you know, they both play simple riffs, you know what I mean? But they're put together in such a way that the song as a whole becomes, you know, a real piece of art. It's right. not, and when I say that Tool, you know, influence me, like, their music to me isn't something that you just put on and you bob your head to, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, and what that's what they really got me into, is music that you got to put the work in to really appreciate, right. you know? Um, so Tool is one of them. Uh, Explosions in the Sky, yep. if you've never heard them before, is a, it, it's called post-rock, but it's such a weird name for a genre. I hate using that term. It is kind of weird. Yeah, know? I it's, don't... It's no. almost like... Uh, like clean tone progressive rock is almost yeah, how I it's, describe it. It's totally, you know, it's very emotional. It's very almost orchestral yeah. in that um, instead of having, like, in something about the genre, that a lot of the song structures are, aren't are really built as, like, you know, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, sort of. It's more of, like, you know, a rise and fall with crescendos and climaxes and then, you know, resolutions where they, you know, they build tension for a while and then you get a big resolution and it sort of just, you know, ends there. So that's another huge influence for me because I don't, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm writing music now, I'm trying to write songs where I'm not necessarily trying to repeat, you know, this section and then do this section and then do this section. What I'd really like to do is do, you know, something where you actually never really repeat the same part over. You know what I mean? Yes, I totally get that. And I, I guess when you say that, it makes sense that you have an appreciation for a band like Explosions in the Sky and also Tool. While very different, there is sort of a mathematical component about how <coughs> the melodic instruments and the drums uh, work together. Obviously, the drummers are very different between those two bands, but... Um, uh, what strikes me about a lot of the music that you appreciate is there's a technicality to it, but there is oftentimes simplicity within technicality. Yeah. Going back to talking about Tool, yes, their their riffs are simple, but I, I you know I challenge any guitar player who strictly is into metal and maybe plays Megadeth or Metallica or Slayer, Pantera, whatever they're into, like dissecting a Tool song and getting those simple parts right, but melding them from one time change to the next is it. Extremely complicated. At least yeah. I've attempted to do it. You know, I've sat down and I've le tried to learn a few of their songs, and I get frustrated because going from a section that's in seven to a section that's in four to something else, it it, it seems it, it seems simple. It sounds simple, but then actually physically trying to do it, it's complicated. Absolutely, I think that's actually one of their, their one of my favorite things about Adam Jones and actually the band as a whole. Their sense of rhythm is it's uh, astonishing. You know that they seem you know. Um, very comfortable playing riffs in um, like rhythms such as like seven four or even nine four, um, and just making them, you know, sounding comfortable playing. I mean, obviously they're super tight, but right. sounding comfortable playing it. But then also like creating songs that you you know the average listener can actually appreciate. It, you know, 
um, you don't hear too much popular music played in seven eight timing you know um, and Tool really is I mean they're a mainstream band I mean and they took 13 years off and people are still going nuts about them you know yeah part of me think that's a genius marketing ploy and part of me thinks that it's part of the process to create songs like that because oh for sure they <coughs> almost Maynard almost treats his fans like battered women <laughs> it's bad uh <laughs> That, considering some of the things that have been said about him, uh, that's a terrible, <laughs> terrible analogy. But um, yeah, uh, th that's fair. He, he does seem to come off fairly abrasive. We all just come back for more. We can't help it, no matter what he says about us or how long they go without releasing material. Well, Maynard is just one third of Tool, and you know, let's face it, one Tool fourth actually. Yeah. One fourth, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, some of his other projects are good, but I don't think anything's ever going to pull the numbers the way that, that Tool did. And uh, I don't want to get too much of a, on, off on a tangent about Maynard. God forbid he ever listens to this. <laughs> um, I but, know he does like podcasts. Yeah, yeah, maybe he'll be on the show someday. I don't know. <laughs> um, so going back to the effect that it has on the listener, uh, I know that spirituality isn't probably something you commonly talk about, but would you agree that, you know, music is, particularly music like Tool, like Explosions of the Sky, and some of, like Caspian, I know that's one of the other bands you listen to. Um, yeah, they would actually make my top three right now as well. Just So there you go, there yeah. you have it, there's the Shane's current top three. Yeah, Caspian, <coughs> uh, I just saw them play over the weekend with like a nine-piece orchestra. It was incredible. Yeah, I saw the uh, the clip that you did. It was, was absolutely was interesting. They're, and they're a Massachusetts-based band. They're from Beverly. Um, they tour, you know, worldwide. Uh, but they are just one of my, if not probably my favorite. I once again I hate the name of the right. genre. But you go but through phases where it's like you band. get so sucked up into a band. Oh like yeah, band. I'm so bad with that too. I yeah. will just like I'll find a band and or even just an album by a random band, you know just surfing around and I will listen to that one album for a month and a half you know mm -hmm. and just until I can't listen to it anymore yeah you know um, well what intrigues me about a lot of the, the music that you listen to is a lot of it's instrumental um, or has long instrumental parts and I mean I, I like all the bands that you've mentioned I, I, I love Tool I'm in the same boat you turned me on to Explosions in the Sky, and the first time I listened to Your Hand in Mine was shortly after a close friend of ours had passed away, and that, that song acted like a balm for pain that I was going through for an extended period of time. I listened to it probably every day for a month or two. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of pulls me into that. Do you think that music has the potential to produce spiritual experiences? And I don't want to use the word religious because I, I don't like the trappings of that, but music as a vehicle to take you to a quote-unquote higher place, if not, you know, metaphysically, maybe psychologically, emotionally, etc. Absolutely. I think, well, I think music is one of the few things that, I mean, to put it in a scientific perspective, but also trying to keep the spirituality thing, um, it when you're playing or listening to music, it affects both sides of your brain at the same time, you know? There's a mathematical side of your brain and then there's a creative, creative side of your brain. Yeah. And it's one of the few things out there where it takes both of them at the same time to really, you know, and I think that says something to what it does to your, your subconscious, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think vibrations in general, sound vibrations and stuff, I mean, when you look at light and stars and all the stuff that we're made of, yeah. really you know atoms I've been watching a ton of stuff on YouTube about physics and whatnot and um, yeah. everything exists as you know a field you know what I mean electrons and protons and neutrons right. and everything is vibrations in these said fields and that's what creates our reality or at least that's what scientists think that's what right. yep. that's where we're at now mm -hmm. so music in a way I mean the medium is air you know what I mean that's where the vibrations are happening but um, in a way music is almost sort of like you're creating something I don't know it's it's maybe it's a uh, uh, I don't know like just our way of creating a reality within our reality or something I'm I think going that's way a, off here, <clears throat> no that's great that's great and I think that's exactly I would call that magic um, you know and uh, I would say that you're probably more on the agnostic atheist side of the belief system I myself am agnostic 
pagan leaning side. Like I like the idea of like pagan religions. I came from Christianity, which I wasn't very pleased with the experiences that I had with that. So um, I, I think mutually it's interesting because I meet a lot of different people who, I mean, it, spiritually the spectrum is very different. I have friends who are ardent atheists, nihilists. I have people who are extremely fundamentalistly Christian and then everything in between that and then even various uh, religions and alternative spiritualities within. But <clears throat> if there's one thing I've come to find out, out about pretty much everybody that I know and that I spend time with, whether they're you know an acquaintance that I don't mind their presence or a really tried and true friend, music is almost always something that everyone who I I know likes. I've never met anyone who says I don't like or listen to music, and I would immediately distrust that person if I ever did meet them. And I, I think it's interesting that it has this binding quality for so many different types of human beings. And I think the whole mathematical, uh, quasi-spiritual experience that uh, music produces is something that human beings naturally latch onto. And, I mean, let's face it, music is... It, it is a language. It's literally Absolutely. its own language. Well, I think what's interesting, too, is it's, you know, it's universal in that I can listen to music personally that is in, in another language or is in, like, a complete... that has nothing to do with Western music. Right. I can listen to Eastern-oriented music where... Right, like a raga. Using, like a raga or, you know, you know, anything where they have lots of, like, semitones, semitones. you know what I mean? Um, where that literally has no basis in Western music, but still appreciate, you know, what I'm listening to. Um, and that's what, I think that's how you know music is a spiritual thing, you know. We, um, yeah. and you can, anybody from anywhere in the world can appreciate any kind of music. You don't even have to know the language, what they're singing about. Um, you can use it to convey emotion. Sometimes you're not even using it to convey emotion. Sometimes you're using it to create an atmosphere, you know. Or sometimes you're using it just to, you know, it's been used by protesters and people, you know, that are trying to put a message out there. It's amazing how many things music is useful for, you know? You're right. And unfortunately, don't you feel like it's kind of, like, underappreciated now? I feel like, so... Like, real good music by popular culture, absolutely. I mean, I'm so disconnected from, you know, uh, artists, like, uh, I see names like Cardi B and... A lot of these mainstream artists, uh, I haven't had television for almost 10 years now, like like as far as like cable, you know, Nikki and I will watch shows on Amazon, or we recently got Disney Plus, and what's nice about streaming services is you choose what comes into your house and your head, yeah, and yeah. when I go to like <clears throat> my in-laws or my parents and they throw on TV, it's like instantly I'm annoyed extremely by newscasts and advertising, yeah. and I realize just how much of my life I was exposed to that and didn't even think about that, but it's garbage. Yeah. Um, so I didn't mean to get off on a tangent. It's okay. No, no, no. I, well, I guess what I was actually referencing was like almost monetarily. Yeah. You know, I feel like in today's culture, especially, you know, after like Napster happened and everybody was able to just download as much free music as they wanted, it's almost like people forget that this is real work, you know? Like it's real work to create music, to go out and play music, to practice every day. So when people complain about a five dollar cover charge to go see a band at a bar or something, I just think it's insane. You know what I mean? Like, it's thoroughly annoying. We put hours. I mean, I'm <coughs> just saying from my experience, you know, for every you know, hundred bucks I ever made, there was probably what, a hundred hours of work that went into writing that music that I was playing. You right. know, and same thing with um, you know, streaming platforms. I just recently had a conversation with somebody on Saturday who was plugging his band to me. He was at the Caspian show. And his music was on iTunes, so I grabbed it. And I have Apple Music, which is a streaming service, so I just downloaded the album immediately right on my phone. And it got me thinking. I asked him, I was like, how much money, do you see any money from this? And it's a small band, and he said, no, we haven't. He's like, until you, you know, get at least a thousand people streaming, you know, you might get a cent or right. five cents, even at that point. Yeah. I was like, wow. So what I did was I actually went on and um, I encourage everybody to do this. Is uh, I went and just bought the CD. You can still even if you have a streaming service like Apple Music, you can still purchase right. the music so that they can at least get something from it. Um, and when you go to shows, buy merch. You know, buy yeah. shirts, especially for small bands. For sure. And you know, if you go to a tool show and you don't want to spend eighty dollars on a T-shirt, yeah, I have no problem with totally that. Totally makes sense. They have enough money. Right. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, but if you go to local shows, even if you're just even if you're just happen to be at like an open mic and you see a jar there, like you know, oh yeah, you got a buck in your pocket, throw a buck in there for sure. You know? Uh, I, I totally understand that. Um, prior to you coming on to uh, the roster of Jabuda, I remember when it first started, I <clears throat> I invested a lot of my own money just because I really cared. I didn't ask the band to do anything to add it. I used to print literally, I don't know, at least a thousand flyers for each show. I did all the design work myself. You know, I, I did most of the booking. <coughs> uh, back in the day when the mill was like more of it as heyday, which was, I mean, you came into it like the peak and then it kind of collapsed from there but I would go to shows that weren't mine and I would go through the entire parking lot and I'd, I'd put a flyer on every single windshield and I used to do that religiously and you know I burned CDs of Jabuda I made my own independent CDs I'd go to fish shows and I'd wait in the parking lot and I'd hand CDs out for free uh, I mean hundreds of dollars that was just given away and I never really got anything back from that um, but I don't feel that it was wasted because I genuinely just wanted people to hear my music, and every once in a blue moon I'd get a download from Bandcamp, which is a website that I used to publish my own music, and we published Jabuda's semi-unfinished album, it yeah. never got mastered. Um, but, you know, it's, it's frustrating because one, technology has given us, as musicians and artists, this great way to get art in front of people. If you were to back up before the internet, I mean, there were starving artists who, one, nobody was buying their shit, but two, nobody was even looking at it. Yeah. Um, so there's <clears throat> this sort of empathy and apathy split that I have about the internet and what it's accomplished because I know I've gotten uh, artwork and music and books that I've written in front of a lot of people, and I can look at metrics and I know they've been digested, but the money's not there. Yeah. Uh, I... I guess that's where that's where I was coming from is, you know, I just wish that there was still more of an appreciation, monetarily speaking, like in music. And I'm, trust me, folks, I'm not like yelling at any of you for not spending money on music. I'm just as a whole right now. Um, it's just it's music is probably one of the hardest things to try to make a career out of. Extremely hard. Extremely hard. Uh, I think it's probably harder than acting at this point. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fair. And it, you know, where acting is, you know, I mean, acting doesn't have quite the venue that, you know, you can't just get four or five friends together who are acting and be like, let's put on a play and invite people. Like, that's a complexity, whereas in music, you know, you can put five people who are really passionate about doing it, practice your ass off, like, do two, three, three practices a week for, like, four months, and you can go and you can start playing, and you might be able to light a fire. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, music as a, as a career choice is almost a suicide wish to be honest I, you know uh, but it's a it's a passion play and what I mean by that is it's like when you care so much and you give such a fuck about it you're willing to go to a certain length you know um, Absolutely. I can't I don't know <laughs> if, if if I could get the data to see how much money I spent on playing music versus how much I made I don't think I'd want to see it but oh I know I wouldn't <laughs> I know for sure I wouldn't <laughs> right. I but, have um, a, a serious addiction to buying gear I have a gear buying issue, and I want to get into that because your your <laughs> your your rig looks like a spaceship. It it appears to function as one too. But before we do, um, I mean it is without the monetary value, and I say this to all listeners: don't take this with a grain of salt. Like buy bands stuff, their CDs, their their merch, and all of that. But from our side, I mean, um, it is nice. Just to get a crowd who gives a fuck and you can feel that. That's the most important thing. I don't think there's anything, uh, like, next to, like, sex. I don't think there's a greater feeling in the world than having a, 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 a crowd show up of friends and people you don't know and just, you know, the stars align and you play well. Because sometimes that happens and you play like shit and the crowd might actually enjoy it and, but you as an artist aren't fulfilled or vice versa. You think you play good and the crowd doesn't react. But when you have a big crowd and you guys or gals all collectively feel like it was a magical experience, I, there's few things in this world that has given me such a feeling of fulfillment. Nothing makes me feel better, too, than like uh, people that come up to me even now and talk about the old days, like shows that we played, and talk about like crazy things that happened to them during the show, you know what I mean? 
like so and so was in the parking lot puking their brains out, doing this. <laughs> Just knowing that, like, I mean, and that was kind of gross, but, you know, <laughs> you know like, uh, we, we used to party hard at Jabuda shows. I was a fan before I was in the band, right. so... You got the John Frusciante treatment. Yeah, the Frusciante like treatment, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was already familiar with all the music when I joined. Um, but when I hear the stories from a lot of the old fans, like, about, you know, meeting boyfriends and girlfriends at shows and... I mean, even look at Chuck. Chuck and Val met basically through Jabuda, and right. now they're happy and have two kids together, and yep. it's beautiful, you know? And Jabuda's going to play again. I honestly thought after the last show that was probably going to be it. Like, oh, the last reunion show we did? Yeah, and even... <coughs> or Karen's birthday party. Well, I mean, Karen's birthday party wasn't technically a show, but yeah, it, it, it felt fun, like yeah. one. It felt like a little festival, actually. Yeah, like it was the, cool. The, it was fun. The Myers compound, like, uh, shout out to the Myers family. That place is a little chunk of paradise and thank you for that experience it was beautiful um but yeah this whole thing with uh Jibuta playing again uh, i i really didn't expect it and it's nice and um uh, you know i think a lot of people are going to be excited about it um i let it slip to one person who might be listening to the podcast and i said don't say anything until i say something yeah um uh, but i think after we release this it's it's gonna spread like wildfire absolutely uh, but enough about the past. Um, you know, it's a great, too, I just want to throw it out there, the fact that, uh, you know, people get to come check out the new project that we have, too. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to think of, like, a theme with it being a leap year and how Jabuda, we're at this point where we might play one show a year, maybe two, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll still keep doing that just because we love seeing our family and yep. all you folks that came, but... I'm really excited that the old Jabuda family, too, can come and check out the new stuff, because I think Bigelow actually has a lot to offer that is completely different from the Jabuda side, too. It really is. Some similarities, but, um, yeah, I think it has a different feel. I mean, it should. I mean, we have... Yeah, obviously. It's different, you know, <coughs> members and different songwriting concepts and stuff, so. It's an It's an interesting combination, because it is three guys who come primarily from the jam scene, and then you, which... That does kind of... Uh, I throw a wrench into everything, yeah. Well, well yeah, but <laughs> you, you throw a wrench into a machine and you tighten the bolts. Yeah. Like, everything, well, like, you. you know, that's, yeah. that's that's one thing that I love about it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have three bands that you've played in, and what I love about what you bring to it is that you are completely different from 90% of all the other musicians that I play with, and the fact that, you know, like, talking about your top three, Tool, Explosions in the Sky, and Caspian, those are all bands that, you know... They're not jam bands, they're not, not even in the same ballpark, and yet they touch upon elements that are important to people who like jam band music. I mean, I would say Pink Floyd is almost like a distant ancestor. Like, I can hear some of their tones in the bands that you listen to because they're, you know, a, a progressive rock band, and they, they, they touch a certain realm of feeling. Yeah. You know, uh, that that's a... That is those bands do at least that's coming from me I don't know if that would be considered correct by Absolutely. the fans of those bands David Gilmore is <coughs> one of the most emotive guitarists I've ever heard the way he makes it you know his lines the way he makes a guitar sing it's incredible and yeah I think there's a lot of emotion that goes into their music and I think you bring a sort of an element um, I don't want to say Pink Floyd but the, the the connection I'm trying to make between Pink Floyd and the sounds that you hear in bands like Tool, um, Explosions of the Sky, Caspian, because there is there is some resonance, at least in my head, from that. And for listeners who maybe can't make those connections, it, there's just um, your propensity for technical proficiency, clarity. Um, like, when you play clean tone, it's just, it, it sounds like diamonds reflecting light from the sun, is oh, how I would describe you. it, man. <laughs> you know, and I, I, always, I always appreciate that. Um, and... So you bring these tones into to, to the jam scene, which some of it's kind of there. I mean, I think Jerry touched on that a little bit. Um, Trey, not not so much. He's I think of him as drenched in tube screamer, even when he's playing quote unquote clean tone. Um, but I think what Bigelow has to bring to the table that maybe hasn't been brought yet is um, you do have a bit of uh, a leadership quality in this band, and you're bringing. Um, some complex stuff to the table. We have some music they're working on. I don't know if it's going to be ready for the uh, February show. I, I hope it is, but 
um, you're bringing a lot of the elements of these bands that you know have been a big influence on you and that I greatly appreciate, some of which I consider influences myself. And <clears throat> I'm hoping to see more flavor of that blend in with the whole funk rock thing. And what's nice about Bigelow is there's there's no pretense here. Like, we all come from bands who broke up and didn't play music for a while, and now we're doing this exclusively for the love of it. Um, you know, we're not trying to go out there and tour and make it quote-unquote. We're just getting together when we can and giving it our all when we have the ability to do so. And it's been an interesting journey because we've only done one or two shows over the past year, and it's it's hard to get four people who have completely separate lives as adults yeah. linked up, especially when the three of you got kids. I don't even have a child, and it, life is complicated enough, so it's hard to do that. But one thing I really appreciate about Bigelow is that despite the fact that sometimes it's hard to make the dots connect to, to get together when we do, I notice that we all give a fuck so much that if there's three weeks in between a practice for a period of time, we're showing up and we... It's, it's all glued together still. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was bands in the past where we might practice all the time, and for whatever reason, it was still sloppy. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's an interesting thing to see in that respect, and I think um, what's going to be nice about Bigelow is it's going to give, you know, the people who come to see us a different flavor and an evolution as artists, both you and I, and kind of... I hate to say bridge the gap between Jabuta because it's two separate things, but we are part of the same scene. Yeah. And yeah. As, since you and I are in both bands, it's intrinsically connected. But I think um, Bigelow is going to give us a chance to show what we have to offer, um, what what's different about us, and not just between us and our other projects, but what a lot of other jam bands in the Wormtown scene are doing. Um, particularly, I would like to point a finger at what you in particular are doing with technology your pedal board is like i mentioned before a spaceship it has a lot of lights and moving buttons and stuff and uh, i you know we switch up instruments occasionally yeah as part of our shtick and bigelow and whenever i get behind your pedal board i'm <clears throat> slightly scared because if it was a spaceship i'm fairly certain i'd crash into the moon <laughs> so yeah. could you give us a little background about why you're so gear obsessed and what it does for you as a player because the sounds that come out of you are absolutely nothing I've heard from any other band and uh, that's a big compliment but I don't get the technical technological side of it. Yeah, so um, well, where do I begin with this? So I guess where I come from, I'm, I'm like a nerd at heart, you know what I mean? When I say nerd, I mean like Star Wars, I mean sci-fi stuff. Marvel? I mean, Marvel, Lord of the Rings, all that yeah. stuff. And part of, you know, that side of me is, like, I just, I get into the, you know, I, and I think a lot of other guys do it, like, some guys are into cars, you know what I mean? Some guys mm -hmm. want to build cars, you know, they're good with mechanics and they can put a turbo in, whatever. I don't know anything about cars. Um, but uh, that's sort of my thing, but with effects and pedals and music. Um, what I do want to preface this and say about just as a guitar player, I don't want to become dependent on my effects. So probably once a month, I won't even plug my pedal board in. And for a couple weeks, I'll just practice guitar on the couch, nothing plugged in, and just work on song structure. But um, what pedals do for me, musically speaking, is they're almost like, it's almost like a painter with different colors, or maybe, you know, different styles of painting, whether it's spray paint or acrylic, or this. each one of those pedals almost can lend a different flavor and um, whereas I think some people will use them just to add texture to what they're already playing um, I actually tend to write music around my effects you know I'll find an interesting delay say at like a quarter quarter eighth note you know what I mean or a dotted eighth note delay which is uh, something like the edge from U2 used but I'll try to take that and then incorporate that into a song and have that really be like the the base structure of the song. Um, right now, what I'm doing with my pedal board is I've I've reached peaked nerddom. I think, with <laughs> yes, it. yes, I is think you have. 
like I said, it's a spaceship, man. It's, uh, it's yeah. a sight to behold. If you, if you come to a, any of our shows in the future, come up to the stage and take a gander at <laughs> Shane's spaceship. It's, yeah. you know, if it, if it could fly, it would really freak people out. Yeah, I mean, just an <laughs> overview. It's just, I, I'm at the point now where I have, uh, I've gotten into MIDI switching and I have a Boss ES8, which has sort of become the brain and like the centerpiece of my pedal board. And what it allows me to do is I can press one button I can turn three effects on, I can change the settings on two pedals, and I can loop, you know, start a loop all with the press of one button right. instead of having to tap dance and do it. And it is incredibly freeing, it's incredibly uh, powerful what you can do with the, with the technology they have for pedal boards. I mean, it's almost like, you know, like back in the 90s and the 80s, a lot of the pros, they had like rack setups, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they'd have a rack and then if you pulled out a drawer, it would have all their pedals on that drawer. Yeah. And that, you know, all those pedals would get hooked up to this thing and then it would get sent out to the stage where there was like a, a board that was like a MIDI switcher, right? Right, right? And they would just press one button and it would do the same thing. It would be like scenes, yeah. you know? Um, now, we're at the point now where like the Boss ES8, uh, there's a few, Gig Rig G2, there's a few of these uh, pedal switchers out there where it's basically like having all of that, but just right at your feet, you know? Yeah. There's no rack setup you have to have. It's like right there. It's right, right in front of you. It's easy to work with. And uh, once you get, you know, down to it, um, it's amazing, you know, what you can do, you know? No, it totally is. I've always been a fan of uh, effects and whatnot, and... Again, I'm, I'm much more conservative when it comes to effects than Shane. I'm a bit old school. I use mostly Boss pedals. Um, I don't have any boutique stuff, uh, mostly because <clears throat> just the money involved with it is a, is a little daunting. And uh, what I like about Boss pedals is I can beat the shit out of them without anything really happening to them. And we're not a metal band or anything like yeah. that. And you know, but um, Boss pedals are great. For some reason, they have like, especially today, because there's so many boutique brands out there. People have this, this connotation that like somehow they're not like quality or something. Right. Boss pedals are amazing. Right. For uh, years they were the epitome of quality. They were Boss was like the original boutique brand. Right. You know what I mean? You had Boss was like the good stuff, like right. back in the late eighties and the early nineties oh, and yeah. stuff. Boss was the expensive pedals and uh, brands like DOD and you know yeah. some of the other ones that Digitech. Like Digitech, you know what yeah. I mean? Those are cheaper. But Boss is, I mean, there's a there's a great show that I watch on YouTube um, by Josh Scott, who's the owner of JHS Pedals, and uh, it's called the JHS Show, and he did this one episode that's literally called Boss is Best, <laughs> and what's funny about it is he owns a pedal company, he right. owns a boutique pedal company, he makes pedals, He's uh, his pedals are amazing, but he states right there that Boss, a lot of the stuff that these other brands are doing now, yeah. like with, uh, you know, multi-delays and stuff like that, Boss did that 15 years ago. Right. And, like, some of those pedals that they made 15 years ago still hold up to right. what is coming out now. Yeah. It's incredible, you know? Yeah. So when you say, like, oh, I, I'm kind of Boss-oriented, there's nothing wrong with that. There's right. tons of pros only have Boss on their boards, and Boss is amazing. And what I... <clears throat> what I like about that difference um, between me and you, not just technologically, but in our playing styles, like if you were to take away all of our effects and we were to just jam, um, I think we would still have this interesting melodic structure that I didn't have with other guitar players in our the groups that we've been part of. Um, if you were just sort of pure clean tone... Um, there's something to be be said about that. Uh, you you sort of have, over the years, you've embodied this kind of, I want to say mathematical approach to your riffs. Uh, that would harken back to Tool. But you also have this shiny, metallic shimmer to the sound that you make with a guitar if there's no effect on it. And I th I, I'm going to point to Explosions in the Sky on that. And there's something about your ability to encapsulate those tones when you're clean that allows me to supplement whatever you're doing with something relatively simple. Um, you've started to play progressively more complex things over the years, and I used to be the type of player who just wanted to do complex stuff. And yeah. before you joined Jabuda, there was only one song where I really got to do that. When you coming on board, 
you know, there's a shift in that. And now in Bigelow, you have come, I mean, very far in your playing from when, I think, when before I ever played with you, I was at a party at Daniel Green's house. This was years ago. This wasn't... I remember this. This, this is was when we had our first conversation about guitar and stuff. 11 years, 11 to 12, maybe even longer. <laughs> Man, that's, that, that's crazy, but that's, mind, yeah. that's how far it was. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I would love to play with you sometime. I'm really busy, but I'd like to, you know, get together and we'll start playing. And I don't remember exactly what happened. I remember Jabuda had a, a show. I think you played with Chief one night. Oh, that was years even, even before, before that. that. Yeah, that night with Chief. Yeah, we actually opened a show at the mill, just me and Chief doing a couple of songs. I was on acoustic and he was playing flute. Yeah. Just side side note, one of the best flute players I have ever met in my entire life. Chief's very talented. Incredible. And he told me that he doesn't even play anymore. Yeah, doesn't he, even pick it up. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't, I don't think he sees, I don't think he ever saw his value as a musician. He's also pretty decent at the sitar. Yeah. Uh, I I think he's focusing more on like this, the mixing and being the sound guy now. Yeah, yep, and just being integrated in the scene, making yeah. connections. And I mean, he's got a heart of gold and he's a phenomenal human being. I, I wish he'd play more because he is really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not his calling. So our, obviously I went too far back with that. Well, so after that meeting at Danielle's, I I can't remember when we when we first actually jammed, but it, the whole point was to bring that up to currently where we are and um, like uh, see so yeah, I don't know if we're gonna play this song, but Shane's writing a new tune. It's in seven four if I'm not mistaken. Seven eight. Yeah. Seven eight. Uh, and it's it it's very interesting because it encapsulates. For me, when I listen to what he's doing, it sounds like a 60-40 split between Tool and Explosions in the Sky. And um, one of the things I love about playing with you, this is a dichotomy that started well before the song. Uh, Burgundy Locks, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, the jam in particular is where I really started building ears to play with your style. And uh, mostly what I do when I play with you whether it's an improv or you bring a piece to the table and it's not my song it's yours and I am trying to make an adjunct to it is I listen to what you're doing and I try to build a melody on top of it now your stuff is already kind of melodic but your fingering on the neck is fairly complicated so I try to listen to where you're at and I'll just look in the context of a scale on the neck that simplifies the tones that you're playing and I try to do something fairly repetitive over and over again that complements the more complex riffs that you're playing. Yeah, I've heard that. For sure. And I think that new song that we're working on is 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 definitely uh, helping to develop that. And in the future, I think as long as I mean we continue to play together, which I hope for the rest of my life I will, because you're one of my favorite guitar players. Oh, thank you. You're, <laughs> you're one of mine as well. Um, yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this dichotomy continues to evolve because there's there's a <clears throat> there's a core to this somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is. I mean, we have our mutual interests. We have the things that are completely diametrically opposed, and I'm looking forward to you know using the guitar as a map to kind of get to that place where we can master that. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of bands go through that. Um, the Allman Brothers comes to mind when I think about bands who potentially master that. I mean, p particularly the original lineup, uh, when both brothers were still alive, um, their counterpoint, yeah. that's where magic happens, yeah. as far as I can say. Even the Grateful Dead, which it wasn't quite as big of a thing, but you definitely hear it in Explosions in the Sky, because they have three guitar players. Three guitar players, they play almost exclusively clean guitar tones, except for like some of their earlier stuff. Uh, they have one album that has some distorted stuff, but uh, they're most famous for a band called, or an album called um, The Earth Is Not A Cold Dead Place, and that album is, it should be, I mean, Fender should use that as like, you know, a way to sell more of their amps because it is just Fender guitars played into clean Fender amps with some delay and some things here, but it's mostly just 
three guys playing off of each other with clean tones and just making incredibly emotive music. You right. Know? And that's that. That's definitely what I took away from the first time I listened to them. Uh, and again, you introduced me to that. And there is a particular magic in clean tone. And you mentioned the edge earlier. Like, he was another one. He did a lot with just clean tones. Yeah, you know, I, I love you too. Not, not as they've aged, some of their stuff hasn't. It's been overly poppy, which is just a you know a byproduct of I think going into you know the the twenties, <laughs> yeah. which was what we're going into. Um, but their early stuff, uh, The Edge is a genius, and there's a lot you can do with a clean tone guitar uh, and a few simple effects. Reverb, um, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, delay. Delay, yeah. and chorus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those three, there's so much you can do with it, and um, Explosions in the Sky definitely made me rethink things a bit. And uh, then again, you have three guitar players in a band that's extremely rare. And I'm sure, yeah. it's, it's sure it's hard to... Three guitar players, sometimes it's four, because sometimes the bass player plays guitar. That's that's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's... yeah. They're... But I love that. I love the whole idea of a, of a, of a band as an orchestra. Um, I'm going to pause here real quick. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for that quick break. We had some technical difficulties, but we have returned. Um, as we're nearing the last five minutes or so of this podcast, which has been phenomenal, thank you, Shane, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Uh, we want to put some emphasis on the show that's coming up on February 29th. Um, it was Shane's idea. It's a leap year uh, that has some interesting astrological things. Uh, hey, Laura, uh, if you're listening from California, if you've got any interesting information from the western esoteric tradition shoot that over to me again the show is going to be february 29th and i'd like to also give a shout out to uh, trent schofield i know you're very much looking forward to this and uh now that the cat's out of the bag you can let people know more about this so basically what's going to happen is we're going to have a show at the starlight on february 29th jibut is going to headline our new band when i say our me and shane's uh, bigelow it's going to be a special event, uh, particularly for the two of us. We're going to be working double time, uh, playing in both sets. And um, I think anybody who's familiar with Jabuda, any of the people who came out to the couple of Bigelow shows, anyone who's come out to a synchronicity session, you're going to want to be here. Um, we're, you know, we're going to put in with the work. Uh, I think the highlights are probably going to be the improvisational aspects of it. Uh, Bigelow's been working hard to get you know, some of the more complex compositions down and whatnot. Um, but regardless, I think any of you who've listened to any of the groups that Shane and I have been part of are going to want to be here. It's going to be a great show. We're going to put a lot of love and patience and time and energy into this. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of people there. So fans, if you haven't come out to a show in a while, um, you might want to because there's probably going to be others who have also done the same uh, consider it a family reunion, let's say, and yeah. and hopefully um, a preview of you know potential uh, happenings in the future. Obviously, it's all going to be Im improv as far as when events come together like this. Uh, but it, it's going to give you a great taste of Bigelow and where we're going and what we're doing and what we're hoping for. And it's going to be a throwback to the days of old when it comes to Jabuda. I think uh, also just to point out, so I know a lot of folks might be wondering, like, why is it? leap day like a big deal like i know it's not normally like a date that you would imagine somebody would make a big deal about but uh leap day only falls on saturday once every 28 years so only once every 28 years do you have a weekend leap day so that's a big deal you know what i mean and uh it, it's it's like let's celebrate a random day guys let's just do it you know right and uh <clears throat> you know for the Jibuta fans out there, you know, I, I really don't know when and if we're ever going to come together. This stuff happens randomly for events like this. So, you know, if, if, if your main thing is to come out and see us, you might want to do it because there's no guarantee this is going to happen again for a year or two. Um, and for those of you who are on the fence, come to see everything, particularly Bigelow, because Shane and I are putting a lot of work into this, Mike and Joe are putting a lot of work into this, and our new new band, it's, you know, it's it's taken some time and some hard work, but we're, we're hoping to really get it off the ground this year, particularly going to the spring and summer, I'd, I'd like to 
see us maybe playing a lot of the local breweries, which now that Massachusetts has 150 craft breweries, we'll hopefully be <laughs> booking more shows. Um, and that being said, if for no other reason, come out and go for the journey, you know, buy the ticket, take the ride. Um, we're going to make it worth your while. Uh, there's going to be phenomenal music as of right now. It's just Jabuda and Bigelow. It might might remain that way. We might have another artist come on or not. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but we wanted to give the listeners to the podcast uh, access to this information because those who don't listen to it, um, they're not going to see it until the flyers come out, until we finalize details and whatnot. So <clears throat> we've pretty much come to the end of episode four of Five Town and Around. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. I want to thank... Our guest, Shane Martell, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, bud. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. Me this, too. Uh, it was easier than I thought it was going to be. A lot of people are a little freaked out about it. and uh, You know what? It's, 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 it's fun. It's, it's not hard. and it's, uh, it, it helps me to get into the brains of my friends. and That's what Five Town and Around is really about, guys. Uh, I basically just want to have awesome people on my show that I know. Uh, so if you're interested in coming on the show... Shoot me a message on Facebook, email, whatever. Um, we'll chat. So without further ado, I'd like to bring a close to this episode. And I would say light and love to you guys. Be safe, be well. This is Shane Martell and Nate Doobie signing off from Five Town and Around. We'll see you next time. Peace.